so my name is Francesco. Uh, I've been dabbling with Erlang since 1994. I um, you know, was part of the R1 of the team which worked with the R1 release of OTP, and one of the things uh, well I like doing is writing books. And uh, so I wrote my very first book, uh, which came out in 2009. And one of the things about writing books is you know, once you're actually holding the paper copy, it's very similar to having children. Uh, once you hold the first paper copy, you immediately forget all the sacrifices, all of the pains, and you want to run off and write another one. And that's what happened with, with, uh, you know, with airline programming. And I started working on the next book. And you know, early release, you know, big apologies to anyone of you who bought it uh, three years ago <laughs> as, as early release. Uh, one of the lessons I learned there is that your partner comes up to you and says, I'm pregnant. Apart from joy and happiness, you keep in mind you've got eight months to finish the book. Uh, my son turns two next week, and finally we've gone into print. And the, the, the problem with this book was, uh, you know, the first book was Erlang Introductory, you know, how, why should you use Erlang? But what I wanted to do here is, you know, there seemed to be some popular belief that by magic, uh, you go in and you use Erlang, your system will just scale linearly, just completely out of the box, and it will never fail. And I wanted to go in and, you know, mis uh, I wanted to go in and, you know, bust this myth. And, you know, go in and explain that you know, there actually is no magic. Uh, there are a lot of good practices and, you know, good ways of thinking and, and running and doing things. And so, you know, the first part of the book was really, really easy to write. I had you know, I've taught a lot of Erlang. I was part of the team which worked on OTP. And we, well, I had a lot of training material and I used examples from the training material. And, you know, went ahead and explained, you know, the whole concepts of processes, how you get processes. You know, you group them, you know, either into workers or supervisors. You pull them to get into supervision trees. You know, you program for the correct case. Uh, you then bundle these supervision trees into applications, and once you have a lot of applications, you put them together, and you create a release on a single node. Um, and that, that was fairly straightforward. You know, I took the training material, we had good, solid, compact examples. I lectured, I've been teaching for a long time, so I go in and actually start lecturing. And when I'm done with the lecturing, I'd go back and think, you know, where did students have a hard time? I'd go back and make sure those parts were clear. Once I was done with that, uh, I was thinking of all the smart students, what questions, what relevant questions were they asking? And all of those became side notes, and then I'd look at the documentation. And then when I was done with that, I'd throw it over to my co-author. Uh, I'd put Steve Vinovsky, and he'd go in, he'd remove all of the Korba jokes, throw it back to me, and I'd, you know, I'd put all the Korba jokes back. And, <laughs> Th th that worked pretty well, and so we got through the first 12 chapters where you know, we described how to create a single Erlang node and how to make sure that you know, this node was full tolerance, how you'd isolate failure, and so on. Now, the big problem came along with chapter 13. Now, chapter 13, in the proposal, we actually called it node architecture. And, you know, 13, especially here in the States, is never a good number. And the problem with 13 was, you know, I was trying to document uh, how you actually go in and architect your system. How do you expose the secret source, you know, for airline scalability and reliability? And try to go in and actually formalize how I did things. You know, I'd been architecting systems at that point for about a decade. Uh, I'd been working with Erlang for a decade prior to that. And I remember you know, when I started writing this chapter, oh, wouldn't it be great to, you know, I don't know if you've looked at Akka, you know, they've got Akka cluster. Wouldn't it be great just to go in and explain how Akka cluster works? But, you know, calling it OTP Erlang or OTP cluster. And we, why don't we have anything like that in Erlang? I started asking myself. And either way, you know, it was frustration, but let's try to do the best of it. And I start writing, writing, and writing. And write a bit more, I write a bit more. And I, I remember I sent an email to my editor in March of last year saying, hey, Andy, two more weeks, I'm off you know, for Easter vacation. Two weeks, I'll send the chapter. And this was in March of 2015. 
November 2015, I actually gave up. This is it, and I sent him about 80 pages. Uh, 80 pages, which was chapter 13. And as I kept on writing, I kept on you know, documenting experience, I kept on documenting how we do things. And he quickly came back and replied, hey, yeah, yeah, this is, you're getting there, you're getting there. He was trying to be diplomatic. Um, but I think you should probably divide this chapter into four smaller chapters. It's getting a bit too big. And that's when I stopped. And then he goes on and suggested how I should break it up, but I never read that other part of the email. I said, okay, stop, let, let me figure it out myself. Went back and in two months uh, actually started sending him 13, 14, 15, and 16, realizing that you know, when you start looking at, you know, once you've architected a system, once you've architected a single node, I, once you've architected a single node, what are the steps you need to do now to start grouping these nodes together, thinking in terms of reliability, in terms of scalability, and last but not least, monitoring and preemptive support. And the results of, this, you know, of, of going in and formalizing all of this ended up becoming about 10 steps, the steps involved, which you need to follow when architecting a system. And looking at, you know, documenting the patterns you need to be aware of all along. And having done that, you know, the conclusion I came to is that there are two things on the Erlang virtual machine, or at the, at the time, well, I was thinking more in, Erlang, in terms of Erlang. But you know, to quote Joe Armstrong, uh, you can go in and you can uh, copy the libraries, but unless it's actually running on the Erlang virtual machine, you can't emulate the semantics. I think when you're looking at the Elixir world, you've got the advantage that you're running on the Erlang virtual machine. So you have the semantics as well. So anything I say about Erlang will apply to Elixir as well. And I came to the conclusion that you know, you've got you know, concurrence and you, the, the distribution will give you two things. They'll give you the availability and they'll give you the scalability. And that's what you know, these four chapters boil down to. And um, what I'm gonna cover right here, more than anything, are you know, the distributed architectures and systems that never stop and scaling out. And I realized that once I'd written these chapters, the reason there is no framework is that there is no one size fits all. You need to write a massively scalable system. There will be a set of trade-offs you need to make when you're, when, you're, when you're designing them. And these trade-offs will then, uh, and these design choices will give you the trade-offs, and they will actually tell you how your system is gonna behave under extreme heavy load, you know, when you're adding more resources, when you're adding more hardware and so on. And, and this is what uh, you know, I'll be going in and covering. But, so, we said, you know, we start with a single node. The next step is, you know, once you've started with a process as a basic building block, you know, you go in and you isolate data, you isolate failure. And once you've got the supervision tree, your, your first step, and you've got your actual node, the first step you need to do when dealing with distributed architecture is to go in and you know, divide the functionality of your system into small, you know, standalone nodes. You need to go in and clearly define the overall responsibility of the various nodes. There's no point in going in and putting all of your functionality into one single node. You do that, you start having massive problems. Um, you know, think in terms of microservices. I mean, the Erlang space will doing microservices you know, long, even, even long before you know, the, the whole term itself was invented. Uh, it, they need to have you know, small self-contained functionality which will allow you to go in and optimize for the hardware deployment. So think in terms of a three-tier architecture. Uh, the way we usually call it is you've got nodes which are usually client-facing They'll run web servers, or they'll run the REST APIs which your apps connect to, or you know, in the IoT space, you know, they'll be running MQT and they'll be connecting you know, towards the devices. They tend to be often you know, TCP IP sockets. They tend to be which are open. You know, think WhatsApp, you know, they'll have two million sockets, one towards each client, but at any one time, these sockets will be doing very little because you're, and not, you know, you're connected, but you're not sending or receiving messages. So what you do is you need a node which is you know, fairly heavy on memory, but doesn't, have, doesn't need to have a very strong kind of CPU uh, power. So we then have a middle tier, so which we tend to refer to as your logic nodes. They tend to run and manage all the business logic. And then finally, you've got a set of service nodes which the, business, uh, the, the logic nodes need in order to go in and execute. So it could be a, an authentication server, 
It could be a, an offline storage device. So you're sending a WhatsApp message to someone who's not online. You want to do an offline storage until they go online again. It could be a search engine. It could be a, an API towards a third party service. So you go in and you, the first step is divide, to try to split up your system into small kind of standalone nodes. This will allow you, A, you know, to test and stress test these nodes in a much easier way. Uh, do capability-based deployment. So you actually deploy on hardware, which will help optimize and help you get the most throughput from these systems. Once you've done that, your next step is looking at how, how are you going to get now the system to scale? And that's when you need to start thinking in terms of you know, distributed architectural patterns. And there are not that many distributed architectural patterns out there. So you know, this hopefully will be a very easy choice. The, the, the most basic one, the most commonly used one, is the fully connected meshed airline nodes. So you've got nodes that just connect to each other. And you, know, you could go in and actually start, yeah, all, all these nodes could all be doing different things, but using distributed airline, you can go in and start, well, you, they just start communicating with each other on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You know, in doing so, you know, be aware of the limitations. You know, you'll be able to scale to about 50, 100 nodes if you're lucky. And you know, very rarely you know, does this happen. Um, more often than not, you know, these fully meshed airline nodes you know, tend to be, you tend to have five, 10 nodes. The next and most common, you know, you know, when, when you start looking at scalability, is to try to apply the Dynamo principle from Amazon. How many of you have read the Dynamo paper? A few of you have. If you haven't, I think it's really good kind of bedtime reading. I, I, I warmly recommend it. Um, it, it's, uh, it. It goes in and describes how you know, Amazon goes in and you know, provides full tolerance and it provides scalability. And actually the trade-offs they've done in these design choices. And the Dynamo principle, I mean, fairly, you know, trying to you know, simplify um, what, what, what the paper says is, You've got a ski sp space, so you know, think in terms of um, users, think in terms of session IDs. If you're thinking of the IoT, think in terms of devices. So every session or every user will have a unique identifier. Break that into, um, you know, you, ha by hashing, you'll get a unique number, which goes, by hashing that unique identifier, you get a unique number between zero and two to the power of 160, which is a fairly large number. And go in and try to break that key space now into 32 smaller partitions. So you know, the first partition would be between 0 to 2 to the power of 160 divided by 32. So that would be your first partition. And then the second would be uh, you know, 2 to the power of 160 divided by 32 to 2 to the power of 160 divided by uh, 16, if I remember correctly, right there. And, and then you just continue um, all around. And each small partition will then map to a physical node. So you're, you're breaking up data on physical nodes into smaller chunks. And we refer to these chunks as V nodes, vertical nodes. And so you know, this chunk of keys, this chunk of keys, this chunk of keys, and so on, all the green one, will appear on node 0. The second chunk on node 1, node 2, and node 3. And you know, by hashing your key space, what this does is it will allow you, when you lose a node, to, only, to go in and take you know, the V nodes, you know, which are on that node, and distribute them across other nodes. If you start adding more, more hardware capacity, you don't need to rehash your whole system. You just go in and rehash certain small parts of it. And what it also gives you is the ability to, um, to replicate data. So you've got your V nodes uh, in separate parts. And you, you will take, so you've got this V node right here which is running on this node, but you can also go in and say, hey, I want a copy of all of that data on another node as well. So if you lose that node, you'll automatically move it on. And in the Erlang world, there is a framework called React Core. So you might have heard of NoSQL database React, which is based on the Dynamo principle. And what they've done is they've split out a distributed framework called React Core, which gives you all of this. And you can actually start using React Core to start scaling your systems both up and down. You don't need to use it for databases. 
you start using Recor for job scheduling, for example. So you go in, you pass in a, you know, using a unique identifier, it will then redirect it to one of these four nodes. You lose a node, it will redirect it to its surrogate node, to its standby node, which has a copy of the state. You'll also get the gossip protocol. So what happens is in, you'll get network partitions between nodes. As soon as you've got two nodes, you have, need to have a network between them. And the only thing you can be certain, you know, alongside your know, taxes and death, is that your network will fail. <laughs> and if your network fails, you know, you've got the split brain problems. As soon as the network comes back up again, what it does, it will give you something called eventual consistency, so that the data will eventually merge back and become consistent. And if it fails at becoming consistent, you know, you'll get back the two values, and you need to deal with it in your business logic. And yeah, there are other things such as you know, hinted handoffs, floppy quorums, and so on, and I won't go into them now, but, but using this, t this type of architecture, you can start having now distributed architectural patterns which look something like this. And you'll have you know, your front-end nodes, so they're the ones running all of your REST APIs or your web servers, and they'll receive all of the requests, so they could be very socket intensive. They'll then pass them into well, airline, yeah, it's a pentagram, apologies for that. <laughs> I hadn't quite realized that uh, uh, the dark magic of Erlang. Okay. Um, you, so you'll get your front end requests, and they'll then be passed into this ring, which acts as a giant switch. See it as a giant switch. They'll receive, and you know, depending on their ID, you'll, you'll forward it to one of these rings, one of these nodes right here. The nodes will handle the request, and in case it needs service nodes, it will then forward them on to these other nodes, which act as islands. So you know, try to think in terms of Twitter. Uh, you could easily handle, you know, I'd say, Twitter scale with maybe you know, 10, 15 airline nodes to do all of the switching. You've got all of the front end nodes which receive the DMs, they'll receive the tweets, they will forward them on, and then the various logic nodes will then go on and forward them on to service nodes. So you'd want them, you, know, you want a cluster for offline storage, you want a cluster which uh, would actually go in and handle all of the caching you know, to serve the timelines. You would want a cluster for search. You'd probably want a cluster for DMs and you know, offline storage. You'd want another cluster which will handle the messaging. So the actual core, however, remains very small and very simple. And, uh, but you know, what ends up becoming you know, very CPU intensive are you know, the service clusters, you know, to serve, you know, to go in and actually start serving all of the tweets themselves. And funny enough, you know, I'd sent, you know, all the chaps to the editor. A few months ago, we finally got Goldman Sachs to come at the Erlang User Group meetup in London and describe what it is they were doing with Erlang. And this is, you know, this is a, unfortunate. they never released the slides, so you need to go, so what we did is we took a lot of pictures of them and then posted them on social media instead. <laughs> But um, this you know, was very similar to one of the slides they showed. So all of their job scheduling, you know, and, you know, and jobs ranging from a few seconds to you know, 15 minutes or hours are all handled by React Core themselves. You go in, you, you know, through front-end interfaces, you go in and you start scheduling jobs. The jobs then you know, get shifted to different service clusters and they get managed, and then as soon as there's a response, it gets sent back to the logic node and pushed back up to the clients. And using a cluster of about seven nodes, you know, they're managing a few million job allocations per day. So completely out of the box. And the reason they've got seven nodes is for fault tolerance reasons. You know, for, you know, they, they could probably handle it with two nodes, they said. But you know, ensuring that there's no single point of failure, they've got remote data centers, and, and you know, they're connecting to a lot of hardware all around. So there were several thousands of machines all connected to each other. So what this does is basically gives you the routing of messages, it gives you the job scheduling, the replication of your session state, and, yeah, and you use all of that you know, to create islands. Another very common um, Interface is you know service bus, so service orchestration, or you know call it also microservices, where you have a common service bus, and then you still you have your clusters of front-end nodes, 
your logic nodes and service nodes here as well. The most scalable uh, solution, the most scalable, I think, distributed architectural pattern is peer-to-peer. -peer. So, you know, think in terms of BitTorrent, think in terms of Kaza. And when I actually wrote this chapter, you know, my thought was, oh, it would be really cool, you know, to have something like this in Erlang. And I kept on asking everyone, has anyone ever done it? And finally, I found a few companies who actually have a peer-to-peer -peer approach. And in this approach, I mean, it will be the most distributed and the most, you know, system and the most scalable system of them all, where each client also acts as a server. And, you know, connections, you know, come up and, you know, are torn down at, on an ad hoc basis based on your needs. And just like you know, all the other values, you can, you know, your, your, your whole peer-to-peer you know, -peer network, your consistent logic nodes, you know, will then interface islands, which can consist of front-end nodes, back-end nodes, and so on. And actually, there's a company, well, fairly big uh, company in New Jersey, which is using this design pattern, which I discovered after. So you need to try to think in terms of, you know, what is it you're trying to achieve? You know, what levels of scalability do you need to try to achieve? And in doing so, just pick one of these distributed patterns. If you're looking at, not Twitter scale, Twitter is not that big, but if you're, if, if you're starting thinking in terms of, uh, well, it's not. Twitter has something like 30,000 requests per second. It's nothing. You know, the hard part with Twitter is search. It's, uh, it's search, it's, and it's serving the requests. So you know, start thinking in terms of WhatsApp, where on a few hundred machines, they're actually serving I think now four times more messages per day than the total number of SMSs sent in the world. Th that's when you need to start uh, thinking in terms of scale. And they're doing it on a really reduced you know, hardware, um, you know, yeah, very, very, very reduced hardware. So you know, start thinking in terms of Facebook, th start thinking in terms of Twitter. You know, at that point, what you tend to do is there's another uh, research project, and it's still experimental now, but it's called SD Erlang, which allows you to create islands. So it's, in effect, sharding. And what Scalable Distributed Erlang allows you then to do is you've got nodes which are part of two different islands, two, part, two different groups. They, they're called S groups. And if a node is part of two S groups, it acts as a gateway in between these groups. And it's still not used in production, and that's because you know, it's very rare that you need to scale you know, to 30, 40,000 nodes. I think the largest Erlang installations I'm aware of is about 50,000 Erlang nodes. And it's more that, and they're not connected, it's more point to point. So, uh, and the reason is that they're running Erlang on each and every single machine. Other, you know, if you think of you know, companies serving ads, uh, ad serving, there you'll see architectural design patterns of about 3,000 nodes. So when you start thinking, you know, as the Erlang, they've scaled yeah, to, to I think 20, 30,000 itself. So you know, when you start need to start thinking of those scales, what you do is you take SD Erlang, and then you maybe start running uh, React Core within the different S groups, within the islands, and then have them communicate with each other. And each group could maybe be a data center. So once you've decided on all of your, um, of your distributed architectural pattern, the next step is you need to decide what network protocols you want your nodes you know, to start using. And it doesn't necessarily have to be one single protocol. This is an example I had where um, you've got your front end web servers running, right? And they'll tend to run behind a firewall. And what happens if you know, the front end is running distributed Erlang with the back end? Have you, can you, can, have you ever thought of this problem? And you start getting attacks and you start getting actually hackers you know, getting into this particular machine. You can, yeah, you get, if you get access here through distributed airline, you get the full visibility into these nodes. Uh, my favorite command was OS colon, so RPC colon call, doing an RPC from this node to that node, calling OS colon command RM minus RF. <laughs> and then, you know, you, th that, that's how you can help your friends here with their disk keeping and, you know, <laughs> and, and cleaning. So distributed airline is not always good. Um, so in some cases, you know, what we tend to do is have TCP IP between, between various nodes. And it could be MPI, so the message passing interface, zero MQ. UDP is very common when, you know, scale is critical. 
and you sacrifice scale with reliability. Could be SSL, or just plain sockets. And you could take it a step further and actually have standardized APIs. Uh, REST, MQP, you know, SNMP, XMPP, MQTT. So it just completely depends on what your application needs to do. You, know, you can pick anything as long as it's not Corba. Now, <laughs> once you have gone in and defined you know, what uh, network you're, you're going to use, what network interfaces you, you're going to use, and mind you, this is still in the design phase. Um, so you, it's before you've started coding. At this particular point in time, that's when you start providing, uh, that's when you need to start thinking in terms of interfaces. So you've got, you've got separate nodes. The separate nodes are speaking to each other. Now what you want to do is, you know, they'll speak with each other through message passing. So, but what you want to do is you want to hide this message passing interface. You want to hide it behind a functional API. It's a bit like, Processes and actors, yeah, you can send messages between each other, but you tend to hide the message passing behind a functional interface. And you do exactly the same between nodes. And this, in my view, is usually where it starts becoming difficult. And it's actually figuring out, you know, what interfaces, what public interfaces do all the nodes you've created and decided to create have to export? So think in terms of, uh, an IMAP server. So you've got your front-end node, which handles all of your TCP IP connections. Your front-end node you know, will be completely stateless, and it receives all the IMAP requests. It parses them. And once it's parsed them, it will send them to your logic nodes, which will then handle them. You'll possibly you know, go in and look at a file system or you know, some database or whatnot. And on this level, you know, your, your interface might be get, login, uh, log in, get, uh, send. Uh, you might delete an email. What would you start exporting down here? So you, you're mapping, you're trying to reduce it, you're trying to simplify it. And once you're putting in place your interfaces in between the nodes, you also need to start thinking in terms of the data and the state you need to store in all your various nodes. So in here, for example, all, all you do is you know, retain the TCP IP connections towards the front end. But here, if a user is logged on, you want to store the state and the user session data down here. And you need to keep on working that way. And it's not that easy. The best way to do it, I've found, is usually by using stories. And you, know, you go through the stories you know, one by one and see how the different nodes interact with each other and try to get some interfaces in place. Now, you'll you know, you do that by reducing communication. So try to reduce the communication between nodes. Try to. Um, reduce the data redundancy. The less data you have shared across different node types, the better off you'll be, uh, and least likely have problems for errors. And finally, you want to standardize the APIs. So you know, trying to have APIs which look all the same. So once you've done that, it's time to start thinking in terms of uh, reliability. So you know, think you know, of availability, think of reliability. Think full tolerant, think resilient, and think reliable. So availability itself will define the uptime of a system over a certain period of time. And now that you've gone over to the Erlang Virtual Machine, now that you've gone over to Beam, you need to start thinking in terms of highly available systems. You know, systems with very, very little downtime. And that includes uh, software upgrade. And the only way to achieve systems with no downtime is no single point of failure. And I'm going to show you some very common patterns which we use. Now, first of all, you know, fault tolerance. You now, fault tolerance refers to the ability of a system to act predictably under failure. So even if your system's failing, you need to know how your system predicts and acts. So think in terms of a client which sends a request to a front-end node. The request then gets forwarded to, to the back-end node, and something goes wrong here. Now, there's a, there are a lot of things which can go wrong. You could, the process which maybe receives the request could crash. The node itself, which received the, you know, receives the request, might crash. The machine might crash. The network might go down. Or you could actually lose the request. You could lose the response. Or this node might be super busy. So it might have you know, thousands of requests queued up. You send the request, but you, need, you, know, you don't want the system to hang. 
So that request will eventually time out and you'll send back an error. So there are a lot of things which could happen. Uh, so you know, a slow node is equivalent to a dead node and that's how you need to think and reason. So no matter what happens, you know, something, an error or a timeout will be sent back and we send back the error to the client itself. And this is what we mean by full tolerance. So even if something's gone wrong, even if we're not sure what it is, we send back an error. We don't keep the user hanging in there. And you know, I'll come back to the importance of it in, in a second. The second thing is resilience. And resilience is basically the ability to quickly recover from failure. So think in terms of a client. We send a request to the front end. The front end crashes, might be down or whatever. We send back an error. We recover quickly. The client retries. And you know, thanks to the recovery, we now are able to process the request and send back a response. And you know, that resilience could actually be integrated in the client itself where you know, the end user doesn't even realize that the request failed because of, of, of some form of failure. And then thirdly, we've got reliability. So reliability is the ability of a system to function under particular predefined conditions. That's the computer science term. Now, uh, particular predefined conditions usually means shit hitting the fan. It usually means errors. It usually means failure. So. Um, Think in terms of inconsistent data. Think in terms of bugs in your software. Think in terms of network failure. Um, even if your network fails, you still want your system to function in some shape or form. And this is something which comes from the telco space. You picked up your, two, your, your phone and you expected a two to on the other end. And if you didn't get that two to on the other end, you, know, you would be sure that it would make the front pages of the newspaper. At least you know, this was back in the 80s and the 90s. Um, maybe not in Brazil, maybe not in Italy, but in Sweden, that was for sure. Uh, uh, and the reason it was, it, it was, well, there, there are two things. One is the penalties for network outages were massive. Um, so the telco uh, infrastructure providers had to pay huge fines if there was an outage caused by them. And second, it was actually legislation. There was law which stated that even when your network was down, you still had to be able to make your emergency phone calls. So, you know, the fact that, you know, there was an earthquake or something was happening was no excuse. You still had to be able to get through to the emergency services. And so, you know, what they did is they made sure that what was shipped was actually, you know, solid. And that's where, and it was solid even when things around it were collapsing and failing. And, you know, there's a few approaches, but, you know, the typical example, you start by sending your request, your request goes to you know, your, your front-end node, and then something goes wrong. It was one of the six things I, I counted earlier, mentioned earlier. So if something goes wrong, you know, it could be a busy node or whatever, we go back and we retry the request, but we retry it against another node. You following me here? So we retry it here, that request was successful, we send back a response, and the client gets back a reply not being aware of any of the drama which was happening right here. And this example I gave you right here is an example of uh, at, least, at least once strategy. You send a request, and if the request fails, you send it again. Another common example is at the most once strategy, where you send off a request and then you forget about it. And there's some types of strategies where exact, uh, at the most ones will work. How many of you have sent an SMS? And how many of you have sent an SMS which was never received by the end user? Yeah. That's an example of exactly once. You send it off, you fire and forget. And you don't worry about it. Yesterday, when I was waiting for my plane, this actually started happening. Uh, good old Delta, at one minute intervals, was telling me that, hey, you're now departing at 9.40 a.m. 9.40 a.m., 9.40 a.m. The next one was at 7.24 in the morning, you know, telling me about my delay. So what the strategy they were using was at least once. It was at least one strategy. So, you know, the typical example, you see the same SMS four times here. And there are no standards in it. So, you know, because what could have happened right here is Delta sends its SMS, it gets parsed by some front-end server, it gets sent down to the logic node, but this could have been an incredibly busy node. So 
the request was still received, but it was a timeout, so it goes in and resends it a minute later. But eventually, you know, that node still sends SMS. Or it could have sent SMS, but the response coming back could have, you know, could have gotten lost. So we, we know it was meeting managed, but somehow the front end node was not receiving the acknowledgement. So it kept on trying, 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 trying until it was successful. And there is a third uh, strategy, which is the exactly once strategy. And exactly once will work in a single node, it becomes really tricky as soon as you start dealing with distributed systems. Because exactly once means you execute a piece of code once, and that's it. The problem is we've got no way of knowing if something goes wrong, if you know, the, the thing which went wrong was actually, the fact, was actually uh, a network issue or is was actually a software issue, and the transaction never got happened. So imagine sending uh, um, 7 billion euro from, anyone from Greece here? <laughs> no, okay. So imagine sending 7 billion euro from Brussels to Athens, okay? You want to make sure that goes through exactly once. I know the Greek would be very, very happy, you know, if you know, they kept on retrying, like you know, the SMS is from Delta. But that, 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 yeah, and if you send off you know, the money and you don't get back an acknowledgement, you don't go off and resend it. You start investigating step by step, and this could be done automatically. So you could, for example, go in and see, okay, have we received an acknowledgement report, a delivery report from this SMS? No, we haven't. Okay. Where did we send the money? Oh, we sent it to Italy. Okay, let's start looking at Italy. Oh, look, all the members of parliament now all have new Ferraris. Uh, uh, right, and you continue investing. You need to figure out what's actually gone wrong and where. And finally, how much time do I have? You have five minutes. Okay, perfect, okay. So, so what I'm saying is for every interface, for every function in your nodes, you need to pick a, re a retry strategy. And you need to make sure that, you know, if you have it at the most once, at least once, or exactly once, that you're actually handling failure in the business logic of your code. You cannot just go in and start, you know, hoping that, you know, by sending it many times, you know, you got to else, you know, this, this is what it ends up looking like. And indeed, you know, I kept on getting these SMSs until, you know, what I never got was the final departure time on my plane, <laughs> which ended up being, uh, you know, 10.30 p.m. <laughs> So um, once you've done that, you, know, you need to look at your data sharing stat strategies across nodes, node families, and clusters. And you know, typical examples here would include you, you go in, and you know, your most common strategy is a share nothing strategy. And what that gives you is you don't share anything across your nodes. So if a user goes in and logs in, we'll store that session for that user there. Another user goes in, we store it elsewhere. We lose a node. You know, we send in a request, which then gets forwarded to the redundant node, but we don't, we've not shared the session data, so we get back an unknown request, and maybe in the client itself, it could automatically initiate a new login, which then stores both sessions in the new node. So this will be probably the most scalable of the solutions. Works really well if you control the client, so the actual end user doesn't realize there are issues happening. Share something uh, comes along, and you sh maybe share some of the data, but not all. So think in terms of e-commerce. You've got your session. You go in, you buy a book. You only store it there. You then lose a node. You go in, and you decide to buy a train set. It ends up being put in a separate node because you've lost that particular node. What then happens is maybe that node might come up again. You might end up merging the two uh, once again. You know, that gets dealt with in the business logic of your system. And finally, share everything, uh, where you go in and you share all of the data across all of the nodes. So if you lose a node, you've got a completely replicated data set somewhere else, and you can continue completely seamlessly. So those are the things you need to decide and pick on. And you might not have realized it, but when looking at your data sharing strategy and your recovery strategy, you made explicit decisions which will now go in and impact your availability of your system, as well as the consistency and reliability. So consistency, by consistency I mean, think in terms of a distributed system, strong consistency on one end of the spectrum means that if you look up an item on this node or that node, you'll always get back the same value. And it goes down, you know, you've got then eventual consistency where you might get different values, causal consistency where 
the, system, you know, the, the values will then converge to the same value, and inconsistent data as well, where you look up a key here and a key there, you might end up getting completely different values back. And you know, the exactly ones will be the most consistent model, but it will be also be the least available, because you might get a network partition, and as soon as you do, you might have to take your system offline to guarantee that strong consistency, because you don't know the state in which you've left the system. The least ones you know, becomes a bit more available, but you, know, you fire and forget. And if you lose an acknowledgment, you might not be sure about the state of a system in one of the nodes where you didn't get back an acknowledgment. And then finally, at most ones, uh, is the least consistent. You, know, you fire and forget, but it will also become the most available because there is no state you need to store. Just send it off, and then you continue doing here and here, you need to wait for the acknowledgement to come back and continue retrying or cleaning up. And the same with sharing of data, you can, you know, but looking at reliability, you know, share everything is the most reliable, but it's also the least available because there's a huge overhead involved in, uh, and a huge overhead involved in dealing with, uh, you know, sharing all of your data across the network. You know, you've got share something and share nothing. You know, the share nothing obviously is the most available, but it's also the least reliable because you can lose data along the way. Now, um, and you've done very similar trade-offs also at this point when it comes to scalability, where you've got exactly ones which is the most, uh, least scalable, because if you get a failure back, you need to stop and you need to investigate. And at most ones is you know, the most scalable, but also the least consistent. And the same applies to sharing with the data. You know, share everything is the most available. Uh, share nothing is the least available, but the most scalable of these systems. So those were the steps involved. Um, you need to do a lot of capacity planning. That's really important. It gives you the behavior of your system. And when you're doing your capacity planning, you need to figure out you know, no single point of failure. So you need to really load test your system. First start with a node and then start load testing the system end to end. Start killing nodes, start taking nodes out of service, making sure you can still handle the volume of load even when, you know, even when you know, you're taking nodes offline. And this will then give you a cluster blueprint which will tell you how to dynamically scale up and scale down your system if necessary. Um, think in terms of load regulation. If you know, uh, you know, if you know that your, um, an API you're hooking into can only manage 200 requests per second, don't send them 201 requests per second because you might sync their system. And back pressure, that's when you start rejecting requests because, yeah, you're overloaded and you actually run the risk of uh, managing it. And by, doing, you know, by going down the route through these steps, I basically narrowed it down to 10, ten steps, um, which you need to you do when architecting your system. You, know, you split up the system functionality into manageable standalone nodes. Once you've done that, decide the distributed architectural pattern. Uh, decide what network protocols your nodes, node families, and clusters will use. And then define the interfaces and the data model in these nodes. And then from there, you know, look at your retry strategy. You know, at the most ones, exactly once, at least once. The next step is your data sharing strategy across your distributed pattern. And the capacity planning, you know, looking at your cluster blueprint, your back pressure. And the last two parts, you need to define your OEM approach as well as support automation. You know, they, those, I'll, I'll come back next year and give you a talk about those <laughs> themselves. And, you know, one last word of advice, and it's don't go in and over-engineer a system. Just because you can use Zookeeper doesn't mean you have to. Uh, just because you can use Kafka doesn't mean you have to. Uh, even if you're trying to build the next WhatsApp or the next you know, game of war or you know, massively multi-user online game, um, ensure that you get something small which works end to end. And if you follow these simple architectural patterns, you know, taking the node types and then banging them onto React Core won't be that big of a deal. But if you try, start, you use, try to use React Core from day one, you might shoot yourself in the foot because you're over-engineering your system and you're actually not shipping. So start simple and then add complexity as and when you need it. Ooh. Oh, one last thing. At any one point, don't be scared of going back and reiterating and changing some of the design decisions you make because you know, it won't be cast in stone. As you learn about how your system behaves, 
you know, that's when you need to go in and make your changes. Yeah, and that's you know, what ended up taking me one and a half years to formalize <laughs> in this book. Uh, you can find it on BitTorrent if you like to try before you buy. <laughs> and um, yeah. And uh, yeah, and if you like it, um, yeah, there are a few. Yeah, I know you like the Prags. I'm kind of of the opinion no one should pay full price for an O'Reilly book. So you can use a discount code AUFD uh, for 50% off. And actually, it's not early release anymore. The final PDF actually uh, got released this week. This week, yep. And it went in print, yeah, as well. So check it out, everyone. Francesco Cesarini, he'll be at the after party if you have questions for him. Feel free to ask, yeah. Feel free to ask. Thanks.